Oh, hello, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. Um, today, we're really lucky to have Laura McMinn with us, who is um, a trainee on the Birmingham route, so she'll talk about her route into forensic psychology, um, and going to talk to us today about neurodiversity. So you're really welcome, Laura. Um, and I wonder if you could tell sort of the um, people who watch then what your route um, entails on your the route you're taking into forensic psychology. Yeah, so um, I'm on the doctorate route, so that is essentially a, a forensic master's and doctorate rolled into one. So I think it's almost like, almost like a fast track route, although it feels very long. <laughs> it's like the longest three years of my life. But um, <laughs> so how long is the route? So it's about three to four years, depending mm -hmm. on when you are able to submit your thesis. And I think it's quite similar to the, the stage two, the BPS route, but as I said, compressed, because um, it sounds like from talking to other trainees um, in HMPPS in the prison, it sounds like the work that we're doing is very, very similar. And the records we have to keep of our practice are very, very similar. Um, so yeah, yeah, so it's just a, um intensive I suppose what made you choose the route um so my story is quite convoluted like I sort of just found myself in forensic psychology um I was happily bobbing along being um an assistant psychologist in uh, learning disability cams and in forensic cams and I absolutely loved it I love being an assistant you have all of the fun and none of the responsibility <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. so I was so happy just doing that and then finally got sort of pushed towards actually considering doing a doctorate by my supervisor um, and I did originally when I left uh, university for my bachelor's I wanted to go into research so I did a research master's and then found that it was incredibly tough to get into um research research assistant roles um so I went to do um so I went into cams instead and yeah um yeah I had a lot of fun there and then yeah I met um someone who worked on the Birmingham doctorate um and through F cams and she was like my supervisor for a, a short while and she encouraged me to apply for forensic psychology and I was like I had no idea what forensic psychology really was at the time but um I thought I would go for it and then I got it I got it and I absolutely love it <laughs> well it's a love-hate relationship I suppose <laughs> side of things, but I love I love the people that I work with I love the people that I've met I love this like the 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 challenges of working in the system that we work in and the the beautiful um benefits when you get those little glimmers and those things suddenly slot into place so um yeah, I think I'm doing. I think I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> I just wonder if you could tell people what FCAMS is. Oh, sorry, sorry. All these acronyms all the time. Yeah. Forens forensic CAMS. So it's a service that was set up. Uh, ooh, I'm going to say probably about almost eight years ago now, maybe even um, longer ago, because um, it was fairly new when I started working in FCAMS. So it's almost like a core OPD. So oh, that's another acronym. <laughs> <laughs> like a community consult like a psychology consultant role to um youth justice workers so the youth probation practitioners in the community so it was uh, their um the funding comes from the the nhs trust that operates the child and adolescent mental health service the cam service there and that's yeah so that's forensic cam so I was working in Buckinghamshire at the time. We are celebrating neurodiversity week this week please could you tell us what neurodiversity means? So neurodiversity is uh it's it's more it's a movement I suppose the neurodiversity movement is about um a social model of disability and about social justice and injustice and oppression that's what it boils down to I think it was um I think it was originally coined in 1998 uh, by Judy Singer and um I think it was Harvey Bloom as well at the same time in different locations they were talking about this word neurodiversity and originally it referred to autistic people or people with autism everybody prefers a different terminology um 
and about celebrating and respecting the cognitive differences that we all have in operating within and experiencing the world. So it's more of a, again, it's in that shift, that move away from diagnostic terminology in the medical model towards a more social model of understanding people and how they make sense of the world. Really interesting what you said about people with autism and autistic people, um, because we we really careful about not labeling people on this um, channel. But when I saw a picture like a meme where it had a person, a stick person holding a bag, which said a person with um, neurodiversity or person with autism. And then on. So they were sticking, holding a bag. And then on the well, next one, they were covered so in this bag was all sort of rainbow colors, all bright. And then the other picture, the person was completely covered in that rainbow color. And I thought, well, that's the thing with with um autism in particular is does affect everything it doesn't just affect part of you does it and i guess that's the same with a lot of um different things that we try to avoid labeling people with but yeah that, that really struck me because i've always said people with autism but as you say a lot of people say we like to be called autistic because it affects us completely um so and I, but i guess there's other things that fall under that umbrella as well yes yeah and there's a lot of debate as to what it, what falls under the umbrella of neuro, neurodivergence so a divergent neurotype <laughs> again it's these words and there's there is a nomenclature there is a language around it that has been um that has been brought into this world by by people who are experiencing these differences and people who identify as autistic as adhd as dyslexic um list goes on but there is yeah there is a debate as to what is classed as a neurodivergency with some people even saying that the likes of obsessive compulsive traits and tendencies and conditions are under the umbrella other people saying things like sensory processing needs mm. fall under the umbrella some people like in the um criminal justice joint inspectorates review that was into neurodiversity that was published in 2021 so it feels like yeah it was a couple of years ago now um they they brought under the umbrella mainly autism, ADHD, um, dyslexia, dyscalculia, uh, dyspraxia, and acquired brain injury, which is also another debated thing. Oh, and learning disability. But acquired brain injury, again, is a debated thing within neurodiversity, within neurodivergency, I should say, because di neurodiversity refers to everyone. You know, we've all got different brains. We've all got different ways of functioning and experiencing the world. So that is our natural diversity. Um, but neurodivergency as a label is the people who sort of differ or feel that they differ, identify as being different to what is the norm, <laughs> the neurotypical and I say that very loosely with, with these mm -hmm. finger quotations, because, mm -hmm. again, it's labels and it's about how people identify themselves, really. Mm. So I guess when in psychology, we often look at the bell curve of, you know, there's a curve, there's people, there's we go along, we go up and there's the, the, the average people, as you say. And then there's the people that are right, both sides of that. So so you're saying the people that are neurodivergent would be not in the average curve, but they'd be at either end. Yeah, so outside of that statistical norm, whatever that looks like in terms of cognitive yeah. functioning, I don't know. But um, and, then, and I guess yeah. it's easier with something like um, if you did an intelligence test, like a waste, you know, yeah. if you did a waste that sh that falls in that way. But most other things, I guess, don't do they? Because there's been quite a lot on about um, autism, for instance, and um, Chris Packham was talking about um, having autism and he was saying, if you've met an autistic person, you've met one autistic person, that are not, they're not all the same. And so, and, and the people he spoke to, he was very different to the other people he spoke to on that program about, um, and, you know, remarkably different. You wouldn't think they had the same anything really. <laughs> they were completely different in how they presented. So um, I guess that's the same with all the different, um, and you've got a lot of things you said under that umbrella <laughs> have you got adhd and you said learning difficulties possibly acquired brain injury dyspraxia dyslexia so there's a lot of things isn't there falling under this same umbrella yeah and i think that's, that's the key thing i suppose to remember is sometimes we we get um we get quite fixated on ascribing categories and labels and putting people into boxes and neurodiversity is more about like respecting that we've all got different needs and different strengths and different needs we're all going to need different accommodations and reasonable adjustments in certain areas at certain times in our life and that's that's what it is again it's that move away from 
trying to move, trying to claw ourselves and pull ourselves away from needing to diagnose and label all the time and think of actually looking at the person in front of us. What are their strengths and what are their needs? You know, trying to maximize on the strengths and also trying to provide environmental accommodations for those needs. In prison, do you think, um, like, what is it that prison are doing to acknowledge neurodivergence? And, and it could we be doing more? Well, you know, so I do, I mainly work in a prison, um, in a HM prison, and I also do one day a week in a hospital. And surprise, or maybe not surprisingly, I don't know, but it feels more surprising that the prison seem to be more moving towards accommodating for neurodiversity and acknowledging, I suppose, neurodiversity, uh, as opposed to the hospital that's still very medical based and disorder based. It, I suppose it makes that makes sense, really. But it feels like there is more being done in prison, especially with the publication of that, um, the uh, criminal justice joint inspectorates review into neurodiversity and in, in the criminal justice system that identified that across the board there are so many there's so much brilliant work being done in various prisons in various um forensic settings in pockets across the country but we're not very good at joining all of that together and sharing those resources and sharing what's being done um so I suppose that, yeah, I suppose that is if we need to communicate more with each other and share some of those resources and share the good practice that we're doing um, in in all these different settings, because there is a lot of great work out there that's being done. Um, and I suppose recently as well with the um, the prisons white paper and the uh, the well, I say recently that was twenty sixteen, so that was quite a while ago. <laughs> but um, but the. the uh, the encouragement for prisons to recognise and respond to neurodivergent people within the criminal justice system, because there are a hell of a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of us around. <laughs> and I say us because I am divergent myself. And that may be why I think that's also why I found myself on this in this field and in this work, um, working with the communities that have experienced a lot of marginalisation and felt othered. And every prison is a point in this year and last year appointing somebody so that each person has a neurodiversity lead in its prison which is a very forward-thinking thing to yeah, do that's fantastic um, yeah but having worked with people with autism um and how overwhelming they find the situation and, and you can imagine going into a prison where everything's so loud and and it's so um everything's so hard so when you bang doors or you know the music bounces off of the hard surfaces um and the walls are covered in material of things you know so it's really overstimulating the lights they're awful strip lights and it must be just horrific um, yeah. one man, young man i worked with he we'd get him towards work walking out of the door to go and get something and he'd hear someone slam a door and he'd go back into his cell again and that'd be it we could work for weeks again to try and get him out but it's so overwhelming for people it's not surprising people don't want to um come out and sort of mix with everybody because it must be very overwhelming yeah yeah and on the other hand as well like prison can be a very secure secure <laughs> so yeah, good word for it and safe so. <laughs> environment <laughs> for people for autistic people and people with ADHD because you know the structure and the regime and the predictability overall 90 percent of the time yeah. is is really good it's really good mm -hmm. for them it's really it's really containing and feels safe it's only when things go wrong and there's yeah. some changes and things like that that things yeah. can get a bit a bit trickier but I mean this is another reason why it's so difficult um when someone's gone through their life um and not been identified as being neurodivergent and their needs not supporting they've developed all these different ways of coping and masking and the outside world looks at them um in a certain way stereotypes them in a certain way so they don't see what the actual need is and then they come into prison and everything sort of feels quite comfortable and comforting because of the predictability because of the regime and the structure you know and then these people do get missed and their needs still are missed and then they go out and then not the right supports have been put in place because of the very foundation you know their neurodiver their needs relate relating to their neurodivergency are not being met and so they go out and things happen and they reoffend and then they come back in, <laughs> you know, and this is this is the this is another issue as well, I suppose, within the prison system. And there is um, 
I think in the, again, the Criminal Justice Joint Inspectorate Review, they did highlight that a significant proportion of individuals um, under that umbrella of neurodivergency do re-offend and do end up coming back into prison time and time again. These are the people that are in and out of segregation in the, the uh, uh, separation units because of struggling, but their needs are not being identified and not being picked up. But I'm hoping that with this neurodiversity support manager, with these moves that are happening in prison, that things are gonna change and they are changing definitely from what I've seen in my very short life in, <laughs> in prison. <laughs> Oh, that's really positive. Um, so one of the things you did, and I suppose it's helpful for people who are thinking about becoming trainees, is um, develop some training about your diversity. So would you sort of explain how that fits into being a trainee and what that would entail as part of being a trainee? So I suppose one of our key, one of our core roles, and I say it like that because it's like the bane of my existence now is writing this <laughs> practice diary where I have to identify all the core roles and and the and the HCPC competi competencies as well. I mean, oh my goodness, it's outrageous. But um, anyway, so the training training package falls under one core. You can hit one core role with a training package, and if you manage to find something that you're passionate about and that speaks to you and you've got that experience in then and the service itself are asking for then that yeah it all it all I was very fortunate that it all slotted in into place <laughs> for me <laughs> but um it's been a it's been a task actually getting like the training package itself is great putting that together powerpoint presentation I love it I love it but actually finding a time to be able to deliver it yeah. to everyone in the service when everyone's around um is uh, is a task <laughs> and then you have to evaluate it and then evaluating it yeah yeah Isn't there are things as well you have to evaluate and my mine was quite an early one so i've repressed the memories of it <laughs> you have to evaluate and you also have to get feedback and they, they're different aren't they yeah yeah i mean fortunately my course they don't need like that formal before like pre and post oh. measure of the training they're they're happy with like a, a feedback and a sort of a bit of qualitative commentary from the from the attendees so that's quite and I don't know whether that's just something that's more recent but I know other trainees who have had to do pre and post that are on a different course so I don't know whether that's just specific to my course center or yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm are. very thankful for that yeah definitely be grateful <laughs> be really grateful I just like I struggle enough to get everyone to 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 do the training so that everyone can attend let alone and getting feedback forms let alone doing pre and post measures as well I think that uh, <laughs> you have to, chasing you have to everyone present the evaluations to like senior management and then you have to evaluate your performance when you present the evaluation oh it's too much <laughs> oh that's that's a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh your and training package sounds wonderful I mean I think it's great but that's me <laughs> I would I'm a bit biased <laughs> and did you learn anything yourself by putting the package together because we obviously we have to read the literature and um did you sort of find anything out that you didn't know before by doing that I mean I was quite surprised at some of the um prevalence rates that were coming up uh, of um these these labels and these conditions within prisons because from and and that these are probably underestimates as well but yeah I was quite surprised at the the comparison between what's in the general pop was estimated to be in the general population and what's estimated to be in prisons because they are drastically different you know like four or five times the size in prison in some in some cases and um, so I think that was quite surprising for me and I was also really um I was really like and even as I say talk about it now I feel like a warmth in my in my chest you know I was quite it was heartwarming to to read about a lot of the accommodations that are being done in prison in various places across the country um, and a lot of the really good work that's going on out there to support neurodivergent people in custody that was really really nice to read and hear about um yeah I don't know I don't know what else there was it was just I mean I it just got me I'm, I get I'm quite passionate about the subject so I just enjoyed doing a lot of reading um a lot of reading on it but um yeah, those that was the those were the key things, I think. 
And I suppose some of the uh, thinking about people I've worked with who were going, um, I've worked with sort of pre-sentence and and trying to explain to them, for instance, and what's happening in a courtroom. And one of the things we talked about somebody with autism, um, that really to be fair to that person, um, if they're having a joy jury of their peers, they should have people who've got autism on the um, jury with them. Um, and so, you know, that's not likely to happen, but, you know, they should do if they're having the jury of their peers. Um, and also whether as a forensic psychologist we'd explain to the jury what's that the person has autism because often people with autism can do things that make it look like they're not taking things seriously they might laugh when they're anxious well we, you know some of us do that anyway but you know they might just sort of look bored or they might look not look like they're engaging and so um somebody might misread that because they think oh you know, they they don't care what they've done they don't care that they're in court so things like that i think are very sort of reasonable adjustments aren't they for somebody in that position um but as you said very often they haven't been um, diagnosed anyway they haven't had that assessment done and I'd be surprised if they then had the assessment done in prison because it's quite a long assessment to do isn't it yeah but then also why do they need a diagnosis to be able to have their needs acknowledged and yeah. you know if, if we yeah. know we know as their support network and they know themselves and they're voicing that these are their needs and this is how they act in certain situations then why can't that be I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, why yeah. can't that be enough? Enough. Why yeah. is that not enough? <laughs> yeah. And I think we have a lot of discussions on this channel about um, diagnosis and the benefits of it. But often it is that if if somebody has got a diagnosis, then they're more likely to get services and and help um, in that way. Whereas if you haven't, then people could just think, well, you're being difficult. Or somebody who maybe has ADHD and finds it really difficult to sit still and concentrate might find that, um, you know, sitting through a long trial very difficult. And so they get fidgety and un, um, not concentrated and people just think, that, again, they're not interested. So it's sort of misreading um, some of the difficulties, really. Yeah, I know. And this is what frustrates me. This is this is also a lot eye opening about the the neurodiversity movement as well. And what I was trying to keep keep the focus on that move away from di like, why do we need diagnosis? Well, I know that there's the, the we for some reason we're set up around this medical model that that autism has symptoms and there are symptoms of this. And then these symptoms need to be treated with this. But we're all so different. Like, as you said, um, you, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one person with autism, you know, everybody they've got everyone's got different needs mm. and why do we still insist even though we know that why do we still insist on saying you need to have all of this money pumped into getting an assessment done so you can have a piece of paper that might not even say this is a diagnosis this person has autism it says this person would probably meet the threshold yeah 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 highly likely that this person might have might have yeah yeah but then, and then why why mm. why when we we're working with someone and we've got an understanding of their needs they have an understanding of their needs why is that not enough for board adjudication boards parole boards courts to say okay they these are the adjustments that this person might need mm. <sighs> I think very often it's not picked up um, in police stations or it's not picked up in, um, you know, the places where the people might be, you know, wherever they were before they were arrested um, and them doing things that they don't understand that they're doing something wrong because they don't realise what the boundaries are or nobody's explained that to them. So I think it's there's so many places where they can be missed. That's the trouble. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And even then, when we do identify needs, we sort of funnel into a diagnostic service and say, oh, no, we can't work with them anymore because they need to have this assessment. So we're going to mm -hmm. send them over there and they're going to develop, try and build a relationship with that person. And then maybe we'll see them. But once they have that label, we might not, <laughs> you know, that these sorts of things as well, where it sort of pigeonholes people into and out of services um, by by getting this label for them. But in the end, is it really is it really helpful I don't know <laughs> I don't know I mean for 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 me for example and as a di disclosure as well point is that having a, a diagnosis of ADHD really helped me because it helped me access medication and that was really for me personally that was incredibly helpful but I know for other people that have that same diagnosis medication has not been helpful <laughs> so um, we're all we're all different and there are certain situations in which you do need like the label 
is helpful to get you the thing that you need <laughs> to be able to fit into the neurotypical world. <laughs> but um, I, overall, I wish that we sort of lived in a society where just understanding the profile of someone's strengths and their needs was enough to offer accommodations and build on their strengths and offer different the supports that they need. That's my dream. <laughs> Mm, yeah I can understand that and so how did you um feel getting the diagnosis then how did that feel to you was it something you sort of thought oh that makes sense or was it a surprise when it when you got it I mean I, I definitely it definitely wasn't a surprise um my brother was diagnosed when he was really young when he was about 12 and my brother and I are like the same person but in different bodies mm. so and again this is you know social bias and stereotyping <laughs> you know yeah. the outside world looking in because I was a girl things yeah. were different and the expectations put on me and, and how I was seen was different to my brother um so he was diagnosed um, I think when he started secondary school and um and yeah, so it wasn't a surprise to me when I I was diagnosed in adulthood. So I was about 27, I think, when I eventually got my diagnosis, which is very common for women and girls. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's incredibly common. Um, our neurodivergencies are often very, very disguised inwardly. As, as in yeah. We sort of mask them to the outside world, but also outwardly in the still in this day and age things like autism and ADHD these these sort of conditions diagnostic conditions are seen as 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 gender bias so they're seen as a male things that affect men rather than rather than women and it's only still it's only very recently <laughs> that we're acknowledging that actually you know women can have um, these neurotypes as well mm. Yeah, and I think what you say is that women will often mask it and women work really hard generally to be sociable with their peers. And so they will do, they will mimic what other pe what their peers are doing. And so you wouldn't see it necessarily. Whereas um, boys don't feel that sort of same social pressure generally to to fit in with their peers. They just all get along together. And it's, it's interesting watching groups of boys and girls at school. But um, I think, as you say, it was seen that it was... Um, something like one in ten, you know, would be female, but now they think it's more like sort of four, five, and ten would be female. So you know, it's because people are coming forward and recognizing it more. Thank you for sharing with us. That's all right. I was saying to Jerry um, the other day that you know, there's it's, it's there's this sort of tug of war going on within me where there's a part of me that really wants to 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 talk openly about um neurodiversity as as I experience it and another part of me that feels absolutely terrified of doing that <laughs> because of you know the what my perception of what how other people could perceive me and could think about mm -hmm. me and treat me I suppose and there's something else that I, I wanted to to bring to this discussion as well is that you know we're talking about neurodiversity and divergency in the context of the clients and the people that we work with but also neurodiversity is about recognizing with within our services, within our teams, our colleagues, there are going to be neurodivergent people within our within our workforce. And these are also people that we need to acknowledge and celebrate and, and recognize that they have very unique strengths that they bring to the service and the teams, but also they do they might well have needs that, that should be accommodated for and respected. Mm. And that's really important. And I think, as you say, the more it, it becomes more um, socially acceptable that people have these diagnoses and and they're able to talk about it the more we'll hear about it because in lots of ways your creativity and the things you know that your strengths are really important in forensic psychology aren't they the way how well organized you are how, how quickly you think you know there's so many strengths you have that are actually really positive um that come into to, to doing the work we have to do so um I think we always we're always thinking about three or four things at once because that's the sort of nature of our work I think that's why I get on with prison as well like that that the the structure but also how things can suddenly change and then you've just got to cope with all the 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 sudden crisis that's happening mm -hmm. and the things that are going on so I I think I quite like that I quite like being thrown around a little bit <laughs> so I think that's, <laughs> uh, prison works well for me <laughs> I think you'll be again a really good role model of people thinking yeah can do it with these you know these challenges you've got and you, you know other people can do it as well so I think it's really important we try on this channel to really think about um getting a diverse work group into into forensic psychology so it's really great to hear you've been able to talk about that Laura. Thank you.
Yeah. And I think like my, my neurodivergency helps me to recognize and um, empathize and connect with the sense of othering of the people that we work with, that sense of being othered, of feeling outcast and different and, and on the perimeter of society. (laughs) That sounds, that sounds very extreme, but in that, in that, that sense, I think that I, uh, that's something that I bring to the work with the people that I work with is that, um, I can connect with that. I can empathize with that, that sitting on the outskirts, that feeling like you're on the outskirts of society. And in those moments as well, like if if I'm, my my divergency as well has helped me connect with people that are, that have been diagnosed with ADHD and that have been like diagnosed with autism and things like that, or when we are talking about these differences and it helps me to, to to connect on that level to say you know you're not just a label you're not just like this naughty child with these labels you know this is a thing (laughs) it is a thing and it's it's an okay thing because you can you can lead a pro-social normal ish life Mm -hmm. and have these labels um Mm -hmm. so I think that's quite validating and normalizing for Mm -hmm. for people as well oh Laura, really, we could actually listen. To, I could listen to you for hours. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experiences and sharing all your knowledge. You clearly have the biggest brain. So thank you for sharing it with us. I don't know about that. It's full of like gas and air. I think it's full. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little teddy bear on a unicycle that's um cycling around in it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that image will um, say all we have remained to say is let's talk forensic psychology. 